this acceleration of information leads to faster and faster change, which is very disagreeable to the people in high positions of authority who have this burden of omniscience that they're supposed to be doing all the thinking, perceiving, smelling, sensing, hearing for the whole society because everybody else is just supposed to follow orders. With this burden of omniscience and information doubling all the time, they get more and more out of contact with objective reality in the sense of what's going on in the sensory, sensual, space-time continuum. And so they more and more are making their decisions based on the basis of things they learned when they were in college 40 years ago or things they heard from older politicians before they got into it. And everybody's afraid to tell them when they're wrong because that's the way you get a pink slip and wind up on the unemployment lines. <laughs> So we got the acceleration factor of information and the deceleration factor of the authoritarian structure, which doesn't like the acceleration factor and keeps trying to slow it down. And that, to me, is the basic dialectic of history, information attempting to break free and ruling elites trying to stop the flood of information from unseating them and creating a world they can't manage because they can't understand. So back to uh, Circuit 3, how does that affect us personally? Well, it gives us the capacity for perpetual learning and perpetual intake of new information and transformation of ourselves and our societies. And it also tends to trap us in the cocoon of our favorite symbolism so that we can't think outside that. Then our BS or our belief system becomes a set of blinders which keeps us from letting any new signals in. If you're talking about abortion and somebody keeps saying baby killers... <laughs> you can't get anywhere because they have created a semantic grid in which the fetus is by definition equal to a baby. And nobody has claimed this that about any other species. Nobody claims that an acorn is an oak tree or an egg is a hen. But for some reason in the human class of life, the, the fetal form is equivalent to the post-birth form. I think that's one of the more remarkable metaphysical ideas floating around in our society. So you were saying that the... Um First circuit gives us a forward-backward orientation, and the uh, second circuit gives us an up-and-down orientation. Is that correct? Yeah. And so this third circuit orients us The third us circuit seems to correlate with the fact that the majority of the population uses the left brain much more than the right brain and uses the right hand much more than the left hand. The left brain is connected to the right hand. The right brain is connected to the left hand. And this creates a basic left-right polarity in our thinking. And when you put together the forward-back of the oral biosurvival circuit, the up-down of the anal territorial circuit, and the right-left of the time-binding circuit, you got three-dimensional space, which is the first type of space mathematically organized by Euclid or somebody writing under the name Euclid or somebody earlier that Euclid ripped off or whatever. And that seemed to be the only real space up until the 19th century when mathematicians discovered other kinds of space. The reason it seems like the only real space is because it's the way our nervous system stacks information. And that's why the third day of the week is the day of the god of communication, Mercury or Votan, as the case may be. So where do we go on the fourth day of the week or in the fourth circuit? Well, Thursday, Thortag, is always a thunder god and a father god. This is the domestication circuit. This is the sociosexual circuit. At puberty, the DNA, which has been sending out RNA messenger molecules making changes every day of your life probably, but at puberty it sends out a whole bunch of new RNA messenger molecules, your whole body changes. And since the mind and the body are one system, the organism as a whole, the nervous system and all of its links to the endocrine and the muscular and other systems, suddenly you find yourself the bewildered possessor of a, of a new body and a new personality to, for whom the only important question in the universe is, where do I get laid? <laughs> And that, that remains the most important question until you're in your 40s, at least, sometimes until you're in your 80s, I hear. And uh, to show how imprinting works on the fourth circuit, there's a case in Masters Johnson, human sexual dysfunction, a guy who was about to make out for the first time in his life in the back seat of a car. At the crucial moment, a cop flashed his light in the window and said, what are you two doing in there? 
And this guy remained impotent until he arrived at the Masters Johnson Clinic for re-imprinting. They managed to re-imprint him and create normal male potency. But he was impotent for, I think it was 20 years before he showed up at the Masters Johnson Clinic. And we all tend to have our own favorite sexual profile, depending on the incidents around our initial orgasm and mating experiences. There you go, we all seem a little bit queer to one another. I call the Fourth Circuit the guilt circuit because every society has its own sexual rules. Whatever tribe you are born into, you got to learn the local sexual rules and obey them, or at least pretend to obey them, or if you can't obey them, try not to get caught. Most people do not have exactly the imprint desired by their societies. Most people spend most of their time trying to conceal from their neighbors what their actual sexual life is like. So the Fourth Circuit determines... Uh, how we deal socially. How we deal with social and sexual relations. And of course, if your imprints and conditioning are very close to what society demands, you'll have a happy life. If they're a little bit off kilter, you'll consider yourself neurotic, and anybody who realizes your problems will consider you neurotic. If they're way off kilter, you're not neurotic anymore. You've become a goddamn pervert. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're stuck with these imprints and these genetic programs and so on and all the things that are going to make up our personality. And most of the taboos of most societies don't make any sense at all. So these four circuits make up the basis of what we would think of as normal human life. Yeah, in the Gary Jeff system, the first circuit is called the movement center, the second circuit is the false emotional center, the third circuit is the false rational center, and the fourth circuit is the false personality. Together they make up what Jung calls the persona, or the self we present to society. Behind that is always the shadow, which is the imprints, conditioning, genetic programs, etc., which are not socially acceptable. The parts that we're hiding from ourselves and others? Yeah. Now, you've emphasized that these imprints that are so important on our lives are, in some sense, out of our control. It's just whatever, either through fate or accident, happens to us during our imprint vulnerability permanently shapes our consciousness or maybe not so permanently, because um, according to Leary's ideas here, these imprints can be changed. Yes, that's Leary's major psychiatric, psychological heresy. Leary believed LSD could change imprints, and one of his first major experiments was to take a group of convicts in the Massachusetts prison system who were due for release, take them on mystical trips with classical music, readings from the Hindu and Buddhist scriptures and LSD, and reprogrammed them into a state of mind where they didn't feel like criminals anymore. A lot of them cried. They wanted to lead happier and less destructive lives. And there was a follow-up study a year after they were released. A year after release, something like 85% of all criminals are back in jail for a new crime. In Leary's case, something like 80% of them were still leading productive and non-criminal lives. Another uh, an associate in that did a follow-up study in the 70s, and all the ones he could find were still out on the streets, not back in prison. Leary had reversed the recidivism rate. There should have been a lot more research on that, and we wouldn't be building so goddamn many prisons now, would we? But again, the government shut down the research. They wanted to keep mind manipulation a secret that the CIA could use for their own purposes and nobody else would know anything about. So the implication is he had somehow re-imprinted them to be nicer. He re-imprinted them to see that their life script, their, their, their basic programs on the first four circuits, were uh, leading them to a, a, a life that would remain basically unhappy. If you go on committing crimes, you're going to spend most of your life in prison, which is not a nice place to spend most of your life. You're also going to spend your time outside looking over your shoulder all the time to see if the cops are coming yet. It's not a happy lifestyle. Leary's psychology is based entirely on the principles of hedonic philosophy. What do you want out of life? To have a good time. Okay, get rid of all the programs that make you miserable. And if one of your programs is holding up liquor stores, you're going to have to get rid of that one because that gets you in prison pretty frequently. 